We don't have a main street or anything like that. That's still very much downtown Racine. But, you know, we have the mall, we have the Applebee's and those kinds of things out where we live. If you've never heard of Mount Pleasant, you could be forgiven. It's your typical sleepy suburb somewhere in Wisconsin. Our border starts at Lake Michigan and then continues all the way out to the highway. And so we kind of have everything in Mount Pleasant. My name is Kelly Gallagher, and I'm a resident of Mount Pleasant. I've lived here for just about 30 years. Kelly is a retired art museum educator and a longtime activist. And a few years back, she joined this group called A Better Mount Pleasant. We started out basically as a local uh, Facebook page, you know, just talking about what was going on at Village Hall, budgets, garbage pickup, just very municipal kinds of things. But all of that changed in the first half of 2017, when the group started to hear rumors that something big was coming to town. Something big in the form of a massive manufacturing plant for LCD screens, owned by the Taiwanese company Foxconn. This is a great day for American workers and manufacturing, and for everyone who believes in the concept and the label made in the USA. Then Governor Scott Walker signed off on the largest subsidy ever given to a foreign company by the U.S. And in exchange, Foxconn promised to deliver 13,000 jobs. It was a big deal for this Rust Belt community. We have seen the loss of, of manufacturing. So when we were hearing that it was going to be thousands of new jobs, that seemed very exciting for us. And of course, it was, it was billed as this kind of a restart, this, this magic bullet to bring back uh, manufacturing to a town like Racine and, and Kenosha that had really flourished for so many uh, decades before. But soon after this announcement, the shine on Foxconn began to fade. Room. Now, most of the concern centered around the amount of water Foxconn wants to take, whether any toxins will be left. That you want to take away my home of 28 years. Four billion dollars or so in taxpayer money at stake. A lot of questions about that. And for now, Wisconsin is filled with buyer's remorse. And a better Mount Pleasant's role began to shift. We started showing up at village board meetings, trying to ask questions, but all of the deliberations and all of the um, conversations about the project were done in closed session. So everybody would get up and leave and go into another room. And so we had many, many months in which we really didn't know the details and people were, were very much in the dark. And that, that is never a good sign. According to reporting from the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, between the middle of 2017 and June 2022, Mount Pleasant spent nearly $170 million on the Foxconn project. That includes money paid to more than 100 homeowners who lost their properties to eminent domain, along with tens of millions of dollars the village spent to build infrastructure, like sewage and water lines. And I feel like we entered into this period of magical thinking right, in which it was going to be this huge transformational project. But at the core of it, it didn't make a lot of sense. In the end, the project bobbed and weaved from LCD screens to COVID-19 respirators to potential fish farming, finally landing on something with the potential for a whole lot fewer jobs, a data center. Hyperscale data centers made up of tens of thousands of servers, process big data, support cloud computing, and serve billions of users for services like Chrome, Maps, Gmail, Search, and Google Cloud. To be fair, there's also a couple of manufacturing facilities and a multi-purpose building on the site, which did ultimately employ just north of 1,000 people. But in the end, the village of Mount Pleasant was still on the hook for the money it borrowed to invest in all of that much bigger 13,000-person infrastructure. And when you look down the line, my grandchildren and their children are going to be paying for the debt that we're taking on. So the town went looking for tenants for this giant piece of empty property. And in March, residents like Kelly got another round of big news. Huge score for Racine County. The village of Mount Pleasant says Microsoft would develop a $1 billion project. Right now at six, a big development in Mount Pleasant. Microsoft has officially purchased $50 million worth of land. The project is one step closer to coming to town. The Mount Pleasant board approved an agreement with the Microsoft Corporation. It was another, bigger, data center. And this meant that Mount Pleasant, like so many towns across the globe, would be faced with a whole new set of questions. 
It's my understanding that data farms use a lot of water. And while we spend a lot of time talking about land and dirt in Mount Pleasant, the real commodity that we have in Mount Pleasant is water. I'm Lacey Healy, and on this episode of Things That Go Boom, data centers are sprouting like mushrooms all over the world, and AI is about to accelerate that growth. But while these data centers don't employ many people, they can suck up the resources of a small town. So what happens when our need for more, better, faster cyber capability collides with our need for land, water, and power. Before we go too much further, let me just say, data centers, they're fine. Great even. Without them, we'd have a lot tougher time developing life-saving medicines or processing the satellite images that allow us to track North Korean missile silos. Because without data centers, we wouldn't have the internet. But the servers inside of these data centers get super hot. Hot enough to catch fire if they're not cooled properly. And when it comes to cooling all of those super hot servers, companies have two choices. Air conditioning, which is super expensive, or water, which is used for evaporative cooling by the millions of gallons. There are no trees. It's just completely flat. And, you know, there is a field of weeds, I guess. And then something that looks like the dome from Epcot Center just rising out of nothing. That's investigative reporter Zoe Sullivan. She's describing the property where Microsoft plans to build its data center. And it's a property that today contains Foxconn's own globe-shaped data center. And these power lines, I mean, the poles must be 50 feet, 75 feet off the ground. They look like something out of a science fiction movie. Back when Foxconn still planned to make LCD screens, the city of Racine was approved to divert 7 million gallons of water a day for the project. And a big part of Mount Pleasant's initial infrastructure investment was also in water work, about $70 million, with another $60 million in sewer. So we wondered if there was a chance that Microsoft would pick up where Foxconn left off. So dug deeper into this story for us from her home in Wisconsin. As someone who grew up in Wisconsin, I care a lot about the environment, not least because of the Great Lakes. On the surface, glistening water rushing over sandy beaches. Underneath, a fragile ecosystem that... So when I learned about Microsoft's plans for Mount Pleasant, I thought immediately of the lakes. I assumed the folks at Microsoft would be able to give me stats straight away, especially since back in 2021, the company announced plans to cut its water use in three years by 95 percent. Microsoft President Brad Smith from that summit, who said the company is investing in new technologies to recycle water in its data centers. And he but you know what happens when you make assumptions? Microsoft did not share those stats. And the village of Mount Pleasant, the county, and the local power company all just directed me back to Microsoft. Then came an email from a county official that asked members of the board to direct inquiries from an investigative reporter looking into the Microsoft and Foxconn projects to that official's office. This was supposed to ensure that, quote, appropriate information is shared with the public, end quote. Eventually, I found a permit application for the data center that demonstrated that water could be used to cool. One document reads, quote, coolant water will be sourced from an existing water main and discharged into the existing sewer line. But I only found that after weeks of digging. One of the few folks I was able to speak with was Racine's water utility manager, Mike Gitter. He told me that the plant would be recycling its water. But beyond that, he didn't have a lot of specifics to share. We don't have any information, really, what, how much water they're going to use. It's all in the planning stages. Turn right into the parking lot, then arrive at your destination. So, on August 15th, I decided to stop by the Mount Pleasant Village Hall to try to see if I could get answers from someone, anyone. I am a journalist, and I'm wondering if there's anybody here I could talk with about the public works aspect of the Microsoft project. I'll have to go check. Okay, thank you. I appreciate it. While the clerk went to find out, I took in the view of a dense, green stand of trees just beyond the stunning glass wall at the back of the building. Nobody's here right now. Yeah, so these are the people that, they, uh, that we've been told to have you contact. No so luck. But later that day, at the Wastewater Commission meeting, I did get something that looked like an answer. 
Claude Lois, the consultant managing the Foxconn project, said that the Microsoft data center would basically only use water to flush toilets. I tried to speak with him after the meeting to dig in a bit further. Um, my name is Zoe Sullivan. I've sent you a couple emails. And yeah, no, I don't, I don't do intercourse. Sorry. When I reached out to Microsoft for comment, they also declined. Uh, there is indeed a transparency problem. That's Dr. Ann Pasek. She's a researcher at Trent University in Canada, and her work focuses on the nexus between information technologies and the environment. And it used to be quite ubiquitous and still is in many corners that, you know, disclosing basic things like how much energy a data center draws from the grid, how much water it pulls from a utility, is sort of seen as like a trade secret. So it can be really frustrating and really quite difficult for citizens who are engaged on these issues in a local capacity to like get the basics on the table. An April Washington Post article about data centers in the West featured a legal battle between Google and residents of a town in Oregon, the Dalles. The fight was about the company's refusal to disclose its water use. The house was built in 2005, and the water level in our wells dropped 15 feet. So that's in 16 years, it's dropped 15 feet. Don Rasmussen lives on the outskirts of the Dalles. Ultimately, the case revealed that Google consumed a quarter of the town's water. It also prompted the company to begin sharing its worldwide water use publicly. When you think about the size of the Great Lakes, the fact that they represent 90% of the country's freshwater surface water and 20% of the world's freshwater surface water, you think this is an immense resource that will never disappear. Tony Wilkin Gibbard runs Midwest Environmental Advocates, or MEA. MEA sued to try to prevent Foxconn from accessing millions of gallons of water per day from Lake Michigan, so it could produce LCD screens. MEA argued that the diversion for Foxconn would violate the Great Lakes Compact, an agreement between eight U.S. states, the U.S. and Canada, to protect the Great Lakes. History has shown that even bodies of water of that grand size are vulnerable. Huge lakes across the world are just shrinking. The Great Salt Lake in Utah, the Aral Sea in Central Asia, and at the same time, a recent investigation in the New York Times made clear that we're running dangerously low on groundwater. Eventually, we're not going to have sufficient water coming out of the ground to support the needs of people and, in Maryland, agriculture. By today's number, 158,000. That's the number of Olympic swimming pools you can fill with the water needed to keep more than 800 California data centers cool. These data centers are set up to operate 20 years. So what is it going to look like in 2040 here? Climate change impacts are accelerating and becoming more dramatic, like California experiencing a hurricane or New York's air turning orange. That should remind us that how we steward our most precious resource, water, is more important than ever. For Things That Go Boom, I'm Zoe Sullivan. Amazon, Apple, Meta, and Microsoft have all said that eventually they'll be powered 100% by renewable energy. But how and when that'll happen, that's still unclear. In the meantime, Kelly Gallagher with Better Mount Pleasant keeps pushing for transparency. And as residents who have a stake in how our community develops and in the directions that we go in, People of all political stripes want to see good government. They want transparent government. They want to be told what's going to happen. What we saw with Foxconn was that not only things were done in closed session, but consultants and other people signed NDAs. All of the homeowners who sold their properties were subject to non-disclosure agreements and all of that. She says that's not what good government is supposed to look like. And she says it doesn't seem like the village of Mount Pleasant is looking at the long game. What is it that's going to protect our environment, protect our water, give us good jobs, full-time jobs, and create that kind of infrastructure instead of sort of selling out to the first person who comes in and wants to use that land? But what we really learned is that a lot of these companies who need to build data centers are targeting areas that have cheaper land, that have cheaper utilities, have cheaper prices, 
We live in an amazing place. We don't have wildfires. We don't have earthquakes. We don't have hurricanes. And we have abundant clean water. It's really a marvel. But it's also an area that struggles with air pollution. If Foxconn and or Microsoft are contributing to our air quality, we need to have more transparency about it. Coming up next, the reason why data centers are choosing places like Mount Pleasant also has to do with the environment and a whole lot of subsidies. Shows what firefighters faced as the fire approached the historic town of Lahaina. The flames shooting past the fire truck's window, the black smoke blinding. Our visibility is really limited right now. This August, wildfires ripped through the historic town of Lahaina on Maui, decimating homes and businesses and leaving more than 100 people dead. Those same fires, they also came within miles of one of only five Department of Defense supercomputing resource centers in the U.S., a data center that we rely on to do things like develop new weapons and test unmanned aircraft. We don't tend to think of the internet in such a physical way, but climate change events like the fires in Maui, they represent a very real threat. This is a factory by any other name. That's Dr. Pasek again. First and foremost, there's the sort of tired story that the digital stuff is immaterial. This is sort of built into the metaphor of the cloud. We kind of assume that it's somewhere out there and that there probably doesn't have a bunch of concrete attached to it. And so like a lot of researchers in my field spend a lot of their time trying to correct that myth. And we'll be like, no, no, come look at this data center. It is consuming millions of gallons of water a day and its electrical bill you know, runs somewhere between half a million to a million dollars a year. Since 2010, global internet use has more than doubled, according to data from the World Bank. So our need for more of those physical buildings, that's also grown. And that growth doesn't show any signs of slowing down. Because those DoD supercomputer centers, like the one in Maui, another major thing that they power is the government's use of AI. So we have to address the elephant in the room, which is always AI. It's a, a hot AI summer, as people like to say. And AI could make our environmental problems worse. One study released late last year estimated that training ChatGPT, that is, feeding all of the information into the system so that it can produce results, that emitted more than 500 metric tons of carbon. That's equivalent to burning more than 2 million pounds of coal. Our digital appetite is growing exponentially, and we rarely stop to think about it. Todd Murren runs data center operations for a company called Bluebird Networks. And he explained to us that if you're a company looking to make less of an impact on the climate and on your bottom line, there are a couple of things that might make a location ideal for a data center. One of them is winter. Our data center in uh, the Quad Cities, we can run about 53% of the year with what's called economizers. In other words, the temperature is low enough, the outside temperature is low enough that we can actually use the cool air to cool the data center. Another selling point is access to water and land, two things that data centers need a lot of. And then there's power. You're not a data center if you don't have power. And not just small amounts of power, massive amounts of power. All day and all night. Because we could be up at midnight looking at emails and we're continually desire more things from them. I get duo meetings with my daughter and my granddaughter, and there's that is priceless. That kind of stuff is priceless. Todd explained that while there are a couple of autonomous electrical grids in the U.S., like Texas and Alaska, essentially there are two main grids, east and west. For our data centers, probably 80% of our operating expense is just paying the utility bill. So if I can locate in a location where the utilities are 20% lower, that's big money for a company. So the Midwest, it makes for a pretty sweet place to set up a data center. Google is spending hundreds of millions of dollars on one of its largest facilities in the world. And it happens to be in Iowa. Google has invested more than $5 billion into a data center complex in Iowa. And just this August, it announced plans to pour another billion into its Nebraska location. 
Meta, for its part, has three data centers in the Midwest, and they announced last year that it plans to double the size of its campus in small-town Illinois. But the climate impact of all of that growth doesn't stop with water or power. And it's not all fixed by cool air. Let's just say the power goes off, utility goes off. What do we default go to? Diesel generators. What just went out the window? Greenhouse gas emissions. I'm far worse when I'm running on generators than I were when I was off the grid. And maybe the grid was 45 to 80 percent renewable energies. To attempt to undo that climate impact, a lot of companies choose to invest in renewable energy certificates, or RECs, that don't always go to clean sources. When you've got massive amounts of money, you can make anything happen. And you're just buying renewable energy credits, RECs. And yeah, I get it. Congratulations. But it's only because you just got more money than sense. The government is especially guilty of this. Recent reporting by Reveal showed that RECs accounted for more than half of all of the renewable energy the government claimed from 2010 to 2021. In the meantime, MIT says that data centers now have a larger carbon footprint than the airline industry, and they consume about 2 percent of the nation's electricity, according to the Department of Energy, a demand that's poised to jump with the expanded use of AI. Over in Mount Pleasant, WEC Energy, the parent of the power company that serves the area, recently purchased both solar and wind farms and has plans to quadruple its carbon-free power sources over the next five years. When we asked about its goals to retire coal-fired plants, the company was adamant that coal would only be used as a backup by 2030. But it also just won approval for a new gas-fired plant last year. Todd Murren thinks that in the long run, the industry can thread this climate needle. Data centers have to become, I mean, they're constantly striving for more efficient operations. But man, if you want to put chocolate syrup on that ice cream, it's called AI. Artificial intelligence that's constantly monitoring the data center, its activity, temperature, humidity. And research on data center efficiency does show that over the past 10 years or so, things have really improved. One study found that while data centers' workload jumped five times between 2010 and 2018, electricity use only went up by 6 percent. But Dr. Pasek says she's not so sure this will be enough. My worry, though, is that if we look at a myriad of other industries, we find the case that we can have very, very ecologically light actions, but still sort of delight in using an abundance of them. And uh, if we sort of sit even with healthy skepticism around the future of AI and how big it will be, how transformative, a sort of middle of the road thought about it becoming more and more ubiquitous, I still sort of suspect that's going to cash out into an ecological problem, even if one that comes from incredibly efficient small parts. It's one reason why she says that looking at new data center construction can be illuminating. Because quite obviously, wherever new concrete gets poured, there's going to be an impact there. Murren says that this is something he sees all over his industry. Left to ourselves, the data center industry, where we're primarily pursuing the profits, without somebody bigger than us going, hey, I'm telling you, look at what you're doing to the climate. Look at what you're doing to our environment. It's important. And I'm big enough and large enough and mean enough and all of these things that I can make it important for you. I don't think we would have got around to it. Anne says that there's also something in the industry you could call a field of dreams approach. If you build it, they will come. There's a sort of orientation towards, you know, if you build cheap data storage, something will be invented that needs to use it. So it's sort of useful to ask what healthy limits might look like and uh, also what kind of strangely wasteful and socially disruptive patterns of industry we might sort of cut off at a head if we are not infinitely presuming that there's going to be a data center for it, whatever it might be. Today, Northern Virginia has the largest inventory of data centers in the world. Affordable land and a low threat of natural disasters have helped its case for expansion, not to mention a massive government infrastructure right next door. But the main reason that Virginia has remained so popular is the subsidies. This is Subsidy, the game show where we talk about government-sponsored financial incentives. 
heated debate over data centers in Northern Virginia continues. We've According to a recent state audit, Virginia taxpayers provided more than $1 billion through the data center exemption. Four reached out to Amazon for a comment, but we have not yet heard back. Subsidies like these aren't uncommon. Some states have their own tax exemptions on electricity purchased by data centers. Others have struck up deals with individual companies. And some of those exemptions can last for as long as 20 years. But states don't often share how much tax they lose through this process, passing on the fees to homeowners who aren't read in. Today, Virginia's Dominion Energy says subsidies are no. It's reaching its limit. Dominion Energy customers will soon be paying more for their light bills. This afternoon, the Public Service Commission okayed another rate increase. And as data centers begin to encroach on neighborhoods and civil war sites, residents are getting irritable. They're not alone. So in places in the world like Ireland, where there is an abundance of these data centers, things are really heating up around what it might mean to have so many data centers nearby in terms of electrical rates, in terms of potential blackouts. Reasons that may or may not have anything to do with climate change. If you go around West Virginia, you will start to see signs out on people's lawns opposing new data centers. If you go to Ireland, you'll see some very exciting protests where people dress up like vampires to explain how Facebook data centers are like vampires on the energy grid. But the Netherlands and Singapore have gone a step further. They've actually enacted moratoria on data center development. These are both really small states where there's there's not a lot of space to build. And between sort of citizen concerns and, in the case of the Netherlands, a change of government, people voted in a new political party that was sympathetic to the concerns of farmers. So those sorts of governments were able to create moratoria and just say, like, no development here for X number of years. Well, we we kind of get our ducks in a row. And if there is development in the future, it will need to fall under these much, much uh, higher and more rigorous environmental standards. So whether or not that model can repeat in a nation as large as the United States is an open question for me, but certainly an encouraging one. It might be easy to see that the water of the Great Lakes is a precious and finite resource, but data is also a resource, one that there's a chance we might want to steward just as carefully. Dr. Pasek says it's not crazy to think that might be an option. A thought experiment that I often pose to myself and to my students is just ask, what if the infrastructure we've already built out today is enough? What if if that is what we should think about making, the conditions under which we should think about making do? That might not be a bad future. Things That Go Boom is distributed by Inkstick Media and PRX. If you still have questions about the internet and you haven't sent them over to boom at inkstickmedia.com, we just wanted to let you know that you have a little bit more time, but not much. We'll answer your questions in a special episode at the end of the season. So get them over to boom at inkstickmedia.com now. This episode was produced by Zoe Sullivan, who reported from Wisconsin, and by me, and edited by Katie Toth, Nikki Galtland, Taylor Barnes, and Elaine Gastel. Our music is composed by Darian Shulman, and Robin Wise makes our show sound its very best. Thanks to our supporters, the Carnegie Corporation of New York and Plowshares Fund, as well as the Cologne Foundation, Craig Newmark Philanthropies, Prospect Hill Foundation, and the Jubitz Family Foundation. We'll see you right back here in two weeks. While I am for better housing and better jobs and all of those things, the truth is, I'd rather look at a cabbage field than a data center.